me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, 23 to 24. Please rise and turn your hymn to hymn number 467. in all that we do. And as we gather today, this morning, we thank you for the opportunity to share together, to open your word, to hear the message that you have for us. We thank you for the message in the word. We thank you for the message in the music. And we thank you for the support and the love that we can share one another with one another as we fellowship together. Bless this time. Bless each one. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome into the Lord's house. It is good to be together and to be able to share together. Great to see Ron here this morning. God bless you, brother. Do we have any visitors this morning? Any visitors? It is good to be together, and we do thank the Lord for this time together. Uh, I want to notice a few announcements. First of all, uh, following the worship time this morning, uh, Sue has the list, I think, for secret panels and the drawing will be taking place, I think, following the worship time. There she is. I'm looking up here and she's hiding back there. Uh, so right after worship, you're planning to do the drawing. If you don't have your sheet filled out and back to her yet, catch her during the greeting and, and, uh, and make sure you get your sheet in because the drawing will be right after church today. So uh, looking forward to secret panels. It's a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, as, as we share gifts and we try to uh, figure out who our secret pals are, it's a lot of fun in it, but it's also an opportunity to think about your secret pal uh, daily and to, to remember them in prayer and just to lift them up. And it's good to know that there's somebody out there uh, who's interested in you and, and interested in, 
and what's going on in your life. So again, uh, encourage you to take part in that if you have an interest and feel like you can, uh, but you do need to get your, your sheet in today uh, so that uh, you can be included in the drawing. Uh, this evening we will have our board meeting. Board members uh, make note of that, 6 p.m. This will be kind of our organizational meeting. We'll be electing our officers for the coming year and also so uh, kind of looking, taking the first look at the schedule and the budget and, and getting things kicked off for the year. We're already a month into the year. Believe it or not, tomorrow is the last day of January already. I don't know where it's gone. Uh, but uh, we do need to, uh, to get our, ourselves organized. So board members, if you're able to be here, please come 6 o'clock this evening. Don't forget the... Uh, uh, other activities this week, the Bible studies, the, uh, the Wednesday morning study out of town and country on Broadway, the on Facebook, Facebook online study uh, on uh, Thursday evening at 7. Uh, looking ahead to next week on Thursday evening, the mobile closed bank will be here. So if you know those who have need, you might look, let them know. Again, that's not this week. It's next, next week on the 10th. And... Uh, I, I saw this in the bulletin and I was like, wow, can it be February already? Valentine's is coming up and uh, there's an all Valentine, all church Valentine dinner. Forgive me, I can't talk this morning. An all church Valentine dinner scheduled for the 13th. That will be following the worship time on Sunday the 13th, two weeks from today. And they would like to have a idea of how many to expect and I think there'll be a sign up sheet passed next Sunday so uh, just uh, be prepared for that put that on your calendar and plan to stay following worship for a time of fellowship and fun uh, as we celebrate Valentine's Day together. Do take time to notice the other announcements in your bulletin and uh, uh, pay close attention to those also uh, I was handed this right before we came in for those who may not be aware uh, Tina and the, the Shoemaker girls uh, lost their home yesterday. Uh, they had a fire and uh, the house was heavily damaged as I understand, particularly the back half of the house. Uh, so they are uh, lost many of their belongings as well as their home. This list has some clothing sizes, particularly thinking of, uh, of uh, Kelsey and, and Tina, but also the others. Uh, Destiny and Carly are in school, so many of their uh, clothing items, much of what they had was at school, but certainly they lost things as well. Uh, there is, I understand, a copy of this back in the, uh, in the entryway on the table, so you can stop and look at that. If you're able to, to help with that, the sizes are there, uh, but you can see what size they need. So be in prayer for them as they look at putting their life back together and evaluating whether the house can be salvaged and rebuilt or where they'll go. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure it's too early for them to it's even gone. begin to guess where things are going. It's gone. It's gone. The house is gone. So just uh, keep them in prayer as they uh, determine how to put their lives back together. Are there other announcements that anyone would like to share at this time? We'll take a moment and greet one another, and then we will return and do our, our course.
standing for our course. Thank you. 
see the Lord face to face. And uh, I keep thinking off and on there won't be anybody dying. Won't be fires. There won't be uh, you know, heart problems. There, there won't be uh, any of that stuff that you and I are facing. No cancer, no your, your body not breaking down, but your body being perfect. And uh, all of the forevers that God is going to give us in heaven, these are things that, that I look forward to. I don't look forward to them as escapism. I look forward to them as the, as the reward for which Jesus died. And I'm so grateful, so grateful. Well, God willing, why you've had uh, a fairly good week. We know that there are those that have, have uh, had tragedies this week, but also those that have had answers to prayers, though, this week, too, for Ron is back with us in service, and, and we're so glad that God has walked you through this valley. Uh, you know, the scripture says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. And I, I praise him that he is. Um, and uh, do you have any uh, prayer requests or any updates to the prayer sheet today. Yes? I have, it's been a trying week for our family, but also God has been in it all week, and we've seen that. My daughter and Kaiser and my grandchildren, their outdoor furnace caught on fire and destroyed the whole back mechanism, so in the last two weeks, they haven't had heat other than a couple little um, electric heaters in a two-story house. So, Rick was able to go up this week, and by the God sent uh, one of her friends, and they were able, it was trial and error, but with a lot of prayer, they were able to rebuild it, so to speak, and they now have heat. And very, I know God worked in that, because that thing was a mess, but <laughs> it was a uh -huh. fire. Um, and the other thing is with Tina and the kids, the house burning, while they lost almost everything, there are so many blessings in it. They could, nobody got hurt. Um, they could have not been home, and it could have gotten to the neighbors because the neighbors' houses are very close to theirs with the wind blowing. While we had these tragedies, we also have so many things to be thankful for through them. And I thank God that he's with us all the time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, Davis. Um. One of my classmates, uh, specifically classmates sits next to me, um, as a classmate, we grow really close, um, especially in the law enforcement type, fa uh, type family environment. Um, and uh, her younger sister, who's about my age, uh, had a stroke a couple days ago. Uh, they found two blood clots, one in her leg and one in her brain. She's a mother of two, and she is really needing everyone's prayers. <laughs> All right, we want to keep this young lady in our prayers. It's Sarah Bettencourt. Sarah? Sarah Bettencourt. Bettencourt, okay. Yes, Sharon? Um, my brother-in-law, Dennis Myers, is going to have his other knee replacement done February 4th. Wow. That, uh, that's such good news. I, if, you've, if, if you're not familiar with the situation Dennis has been going through, Craziness for the last what two or three years at this point, isn't it? It's almost a year. Almost a year. Okay, it seems so much longer than yes. that because he. Oh, and and this is a tremendous answer to prayer. So praise the Lord for that. Um, did I see a hand over here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to raise up a praise. Um, I know this congregation has been praying a lot for WRE, and I wanted to let you know that we do have a teacher who will be starting with false run Lacey. So we do have an answer to prayer. We have a teacher for that. And also, um, Shenandoah County is going to be starting up a WRE program in their school system. So that's a huge praise as well. So thank you all for your continued prayers. Amen. Yeah, that's good. This is my last week of maternity leave. I'm emotional about it. Just keep me and the kids in prayer as we're preparing to go back to school. Um, you know, they've been out for eight weeks, so 
well. It's you know, you're back into a routine. I gotta take three kids to school now, one of which I have to physically climb into the back of my car to put them in the seat. So just pray for us as we get back into a routine and uh, prepare to go back to school. And for my heart, as I'm struggling with not spending much time with my baby. So. All righty. We will keep you in prayer, definitely. Yeah, uh, Sue. spot in the United States. So, um, did I see a hand behind you, Jenny, earlier? Oh, okay, over here, Richard. Uh, just a phrase, uh, Brianna had a car wreck this week, and uh, she's a little cut up and banged up, but thankfully she's okay. Good, I'm glad you're okay, Brianna. Yes? I was in a in class at school, and um, something in my lower back, I felt something in my lower back pop, and my lower back That's a you know that's a good thing to be able to yeah I hurt my back with the weights so so uh, you know there, there there's a, a silver lining to the cloud there for you but yes over here somewhere oh okay Robert. It's good to be reminded of that. Keep uh, Governor Youngkin, uh, Lieutenant Governor Sears, and uh, also Attorney General Yaris, keep them in your prayers. Um, they are in a very difficult situation um, as far as their position, and yet they are all three by their own testimony where they feel God called them to be. So let's keep them in our prayers. Anything else? Yes, Evelyn? Unspoken? Okay. Anybody else with an unspoken? You just say and pray for me, but I can't talk about it in public. Okay. All right. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. In your mercy, God, you have given us salvation. Uh, not a salvation, Lord, that came by instructions and our capability of following them, but rather, Lord, you gave us a salvation that you yourself completed so that we could put our confidence in that plan. And that plan, Lord, was that Jesus would become the head and we would become the body and thereby the two becoming one flesh, we would enter into heavenly habitations with certainty. And we praise you, Lord, for that today. Among our congregation, Lord, are those that have lost loved ones or have friends that lost loved ones. And we are even still struggling because relationships on this earth are very important. 
And when we lose those relationships, even if it is for a short time between now and glory, why we have a tendency to feel that loss very keenly. And I pray, God, you would be with those that are struggling, having lost loved ones. Thank you, Lord, that uh, Tina and the girls are okay and that everything is fine. Uh, but uh, there are also some temporal needs, Lord, that we would like to be a part of satisfying. If you would be so kind, Lord, to use us and to help us to be the instruments of mercy to this family, Lord. We love you and we love them and we want to, um, to see your Holy Spirit at work. We want to see the mercy and the grace of God at work. Help us, Lord, I pray, to see you beyond what we could have done without your help so that we can see the mercies of God and the glory of God displayed against the backdrop of this human tragedy. I pray, Father, for those that have received answers to prayer that you would continue, Lord, to help them. We think of Ron and of Dennis and ask God your continued hand on them as well as others. Some, Lord, that are on the cancer list have been struggling lately and they need your help. I pray, Father, that you would intervene for them. For those, Lord, that are shut in and are unable to be with us because of either the uh, disease or either because of uh, their own bodies just simply uh, unable to get out. I pray, Lord, your hand on them. Be with our dear friends and neighbors, Lord, that surround us every day and every week. So many of them, Lord, are struggling with things that we're unaware of. And uh, when you let us know of something that is happening, uh, like with Davis's friend's sister, I pray, God, that you would help us to realize you didn't let us know that just solely because uh, it was a curiosity. No, Lord, you brought this to our attention because you wanted us to pray. And so, Lord, we do pray. We ask, Lord, you'd be with those that have unspoken needs today. So many times, Lord, we face personal issues that cannot be expressed in a public forum. And we need your help and the prayers of our brothers and sisters nonetheless. Be with our governor. Be with our lieutenant governor, our attorney general. Be with others, Lord, that are uh, serving us in the house in Richmond. I pray, God, your hand upon our government in Virginia, as well as our United States government, which also influences us. We praise you, Lord, for what you've been doing with WRE and ask for your continued hand upon the program. I pray, Father, that you would be with our emergency services personnel and with our military, that they would finish the work that you've given them to do and that they would return home. We pray also for our missionaries, Lord, and ask God that the gospel would go forward in all areas to which you have place them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I invite you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. That's 1 uh, John, so that's at the back of the Bible, rather than the Gospel of John, which would be towards the front. And we're looking at verses... Uh, 7 through 12 today. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Let's pray for the message this morning. Father, this is your word, it's not mine. It's not anybody's, Lord. None of us has the right to do with this Bible what we choose to do with this Bible. And yet, Lord, because of our natural state, many times we find ourselves mentally going astray, not, uh, not really reading but catching the key words. I pray, God, that you would help us not to do that this morning. Let your word speak in the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. The scripture states to us in verse 10, This is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. John takes the, the passage here, he takes the reference, and he says, he, he juxtaposes it, he says, Generally speaking, you believe that because you love God, God has in turn loved you. And John is trying to say, no, it's the other way around. Before you even were, God loved you. Before you even existed in time and space, God already had his heart set on you. Now, if you pause and you think about that, you're going to understand then that such a love cannot be broken. But we don't know about that kind of thing because in this world, people say they love us and then they break that. They say that they care and then they are distant. This world is not the place where love comes from, but the scripture says love comes from God. Now in this series thus far, we've talked about salvation is a promise, and since salvation is a promise, then and it's God making the promise, it won't be broken. To give us an earthly idea of this promise, God has used betrothal and he has betrothed himself to us so that we understand that we can enjoy the love and the security of marriage before it, was, it, it is consummated. So we are awaiting the consummation of Christ in the church, but right now it has not yet happened. We are betrothed to him though, so we also know that there are certain expectations within that kind of a relationship. One is that the church should maintain their faith in Christ no matter what. The other is that Christ should prepare a place for them. And if he prepares a place for them, that he will come again and receive them to himself so that where he is, there we may be also. And then we talked about, uh, last week, we talked about uh, because he loves me. And uh, that, that subject about the love that is required in order to meet the necessity of salvation, that it was Jesus' love, not the quality of our love, because we are one flesh with him. He is the head, we are the body, he is the vine, we are the branches, it is the relationship of Christ with the Father that guarantees us the love needed in order to see salvation. Okay? So we understand then that we have been betrothed with a promise that cannot be broken. God will not break it. We understand then that we have a love that is a perfect love between Christ and the Father and because we have been made one flesh with Christ, we share in that love. It is not based upon the quality of your love for God. Then we come today to this idea of foreknowledge. 
Now, all of these sermons, okay, the sermon about salvation is a promise, the sermon about, uh, uh, about because he loves me, and today's sermon foreknowledge, these are all so that you will have the assurance of salvation. Okay, this is not to tell some story about a God who, who picks and chooses people and, and that other, we talked about this last week, but, but there are plenty of people that say they love God but don't love God. They really love themselves. And they figure that if God wants to be in their orbit, why, he's welcome in their orbit. But that's not at all what the scripture tells us. We're supposed to be coming into God's orbit, not the other way around. And so the love of man for God is not the basis. It cannot be the basis for our salvation. The love of Christ must be that basis. And so then we also see the scripture here in the text that says that it was God's uh, will for us to, uh, let's see here, I've got to get the wording and my eyes are scanning to find the passage, so give me just a second. Well, anyways, um, it says that through him, uh, that we are through God that, and through Christ, that is what, how we are to uh, come into this love. Now, again, the, the terminology here sometimes can be a little tricky. You have to take a look at the, at the context to understand the connotation of the word. When the scripture says that we've come into this love through Christ, it doesn't mean on account of Christ. It means actually through being one flesh with him, through being in Christ. As I said one week, in here I have sanitizer, okay? It is in the bottle, okay? In that same sense, we are to be in Christ, okay? We're not to be like, you know, uh, here's the bottle and here's the remote and, and uh, the bottle says, oh, here, just do this thing and learn this and follow this and obey this and then I'll save you. And the remote says, well, okay, don't worry, don't worry, I'll do my best. And in the end, the remote has to make excuses for his failures. That's not salvation. That is not what the Bible is talking about. It is talking about being in Christ, about being joined to him, flesh to flesh, spirit to spirit. As man and wife become one, so the church and Jesus become one. And so then all of the perfections of Jesus apply to the church because of marriage. They don't apply to the church for any other reason. Now, I am scripture heavy today. I'm going to try my best to just keep plowing through here. First of all, the scripture tells us clearly God knew from the start those he loved. Okay, and Ephesians chapter 1 is where we're going to find the understanding that we need. Ephesians. Verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity in all things in heaven and earth under Christ. 
first of all, the scripture tells us this. We were destined to be saved according to God's divine appointments. From the beginning, before the creation of the earth, God knew the names and the lives of everyone who would be saved. Now, this is not something that you would ever be capable of. This is God we're talking about, not man. If it were man, man might make mistakes. God made no mistakes whatsoever in this. Look at Acts chapter 13 for some reference. We're looking at verses 46 to 49. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first. They're talking to some Jewish people. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. You remember what we said here in this statement at the beginning. Okay, we were destined to be saved according to God's divine appointments. Some people that are going to be saved have not yet been born. But God knows them. And he has an appointed time for them to be saved. Some of us that are here today have all of our lives heard the gospel off and on, bits and pieces. And we are still not saved. For some of us, the appointed time has not yet come. The scripture says this, it says, Behold, now is the time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What does that mean? Well, it, it means anywhere from now until the day you die. This is the time of salvation. In the Old Testament was the time of learning and of atonement, and there was all kinds of things that were happening in the Old Testament to set up the gospel so that when Jesus arrived, he could fulfill the gospel. Okay? Now, up until then was the time of the promised Messiah. Now that the Messiah has arrived, now is the time for salvation. That's what the scripture is driving at. You have an appointed time. Today may be that appointed time. Today may be that time when God is going to flip the light switch on in your head or flip it on in your heart. Today may be the time where God is going to call to you in your heart and he's going to say to you now, give your life to me, trust me. Listen, if salvation, and, and today's message about foreknowledge is it's important that this is such a broad subject I'm only applying the foreknowledge to the plan of salvation right now today, okay? There's so much else that can be said about it, but this isn't intended to be an exhaustive sermon. You would have to come to an entire series to hear an exhaustive examination of foreknowledge, and even then we would probably only begin to scrape the base of the foothills of God's knowledge. But uh, anyway, the... Uh, the matter of salvation is such that if you were destined and it wasn't you just randomly making a choice, but it was God that converted you and it was God that seized upon your heart and it was God that called you. You see, God called me into the ministry and I was also saved at the, pretty much the same time. But I remember that calling. And when God calls you into his kingdom, you will remember that day forever. Or maybe it will be a, a series of events within a fairly short period of time. Where all you can say is, I was one way and now I'm another. You don't know. 
But this we know. The scripture says that in Acts, all who were appointed to eternal life believed. We understand that we have these appointments and we have this destination by God. Then we also see here this statement. We were chosen in Christ according to God's pleasure and will. Verses 5 and 6 of Ephesians 1. The scripture is not duplicitous in how it states yours and my election. It's not duplicitous at all. It says specifically, you were chosen in Christ before the creation of the world. If you don't like the doctrine of election, I suppose you might reorganize that phrase to make it mean something other than it is, but it's definitive. It's definitive. One of the things growing up mostly with Arminian theology was that I had to deal with this. I had to grapple with this. Because Arminian theology basically tells me that God has laid out a proposition and here's this proposition and you will either take up the proposition or you will leave the proposition and if you take up the proposition, why then it is up to you to keep the proposition. And then by the end of the day, I was totally crazy trying to figure out how it is that Arminian theology says this and the Bible says something else. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating for Calvinism either. Don't get me wrong. What I'm out advocating for is biblical theology. There was a time I was in Columbia City, Indiana. I was pastoring there, and I was preparing a message. And I remember reading something of, of this nature, chosen since the beginning of creation, something of this nature. And I remember saying to myself, well, you know, that, that violates the theology that I'm supposed to be preaching at this church. How can I reword that so that it fits the theology? That was the moment at which God kicked me in the seat of the pants and said, you have absolutely no business reorganizing or rewording the scripture to make it fit into a theological filter. And ever since then, I have stopped filtering. Now, it's not to say that I haven't learned a great deal since then. I have learned a great deal since then. But we're going all the way back to when I was still fairly much a young man, 1996-ish. And I realized I was doing the wrong thing. Now, some of you maybe are struggling in the same way. You have a theology you were brought up with, a way of analyzing the scripture that you've always analyzed the scripture that way. And now you get to this point and you begin to read things and it violates the theological presumptions that you've had. Maybe you don't even know whether you're Arminian or Calvinist in your doctrine, whether you're Reformed or or maybe you're just some guy just trying to figure his way out through the Bible. But the scripture is clear on this subject. You were chosen in Christ before the creation of the world. Now, this is not unfair of God. In fact, it's glorious. Because that means that you, if you've been converted... That means that you have an absolute assurance. You will be saved. Now, you may say, well, what if a person violates? A converted person does not violate the word of God. He may fall, he may stumble, but God will discipline him and bring him back. Okay? It will happen that way. We are the objects of all of the mercies of God. Romans 8. And we're looking at verses 22 to 25. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, 
the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. All of the mercies of God are poured out upon us. Why? Well, for one thing, Christ doesn't need the mercies of God. We do. And they are poured out on us in such a way that the earth itself is longing to see the revealing of the church. But not only the earth, but our own natural bodies are longing to be freed. The redemption, the Bible says, of our bodies. Why does it say of our bodies? Well, because the other parts of us are spiritual in nature. The body is the only physical part of us. And that physical part, the Bible said, must die, for it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. But this body, once it dies, the Bible said, it will be sown in incorruption, but or sown in corruption, but raised incorruptible. It will be sown in mortality, but raised immortal. All of the mercies of God are focused upon you. Now, Let's take a look at that. The foreknowledge of God means that from before the creation of the world, he had you in mind. His heart was set on you. Okay? The foreknowledge of God means that because his heart was set on you, he appointed a time when you would be saved. Because he appointed a time when you would be saved and you will not miss that appointment, then you know that you will be converted. Having been converted and having a new nature, being the nature of Christ, because you are one with Christ, now you will enjoy all of the mercies of God upon your life. Now, this is not for your sake that he does this. Let's be careful that we don't mingle Christianity with humanism. It is not for your sake that he does this. It is for his own glorious name's sake that he does this. Do not forget the first message of the year that I preached, all for the glory of God. Everything that he is doing, he is doing for his glory. Your salvation is to show and demonstrate his glory. How he can save people who have fallen, are in rebellion, and are completely depraved. How a holy God can come in and save them. This is the great mystery. This is the glory of God. This is your salvation. It's the glory of God. So also God imputes his love to us. In Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured uh, out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see here in the scripture, God's love has been poured out into our hearts. He has imputed the love, the perfect love of Christ to us. We've talked about the imputed righteousness and holiness, the death and the resurrection, but the love of God also has to be imputed to us. We talked about that more last week in detail. Christ justifies us 
in himself by his good works. Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because the works of the law no one will be justified. And uh, Romans, back to Romans 5 again. Maybe I should have juxtaposed those so that we wouldn't have to do all this turning of pages, but still. Looking at verses 17 to 19. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through the one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all the people, so also the righteousness, uh, the righteous act resulted, one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though... Uh, as through the disobedience of the one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. So here in the scripture we see this justification is not based on your works. It's based on the works of Christ. You say, well, justification is not by works, not by your works. It's by the works of Christ, and those have been imputed to us along with his love. And the hope of Christ leads to discipline, which is not imputed. This is the only thing that is not imputed to you, the discipline of God. God will give you discipline. You are going to have to walk through it. In Hebrews 5, 7 through 10, we read there that Christ himself underwent discipline. And you say, well, why would he have to go through discipline? According to the scripture, he was 100% human, not just 100% God. And the Son of Man had to go through the discipline of, of God himself because God, according to uh, Hebrews 12, 4 through 8, God disciplines the one he loves as a son and he scourges everyone that belongs to him. So it was fulfilled in our elder brother Jesus, so it is fulfilled in our lives. Discipline cannot be imputed to you. You have to go through discipline. But it's all that God leaves to you. Okay? The conditions of sonship, the conditions of salvation, all of that taken care of in Christ. Salvation flows from a covenant between Christ and the Father sealed in the Holy Spirit. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. 
For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, God brings his firstborn into the world and he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has, uh, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not the angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And so in this chapter in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, but uh, the writer of Hebrews starts out the book of Hebrews by pointing out the covenant that the Father made with the Son. And that covenant includes your salvation. Now, if God had made a covenant with you, would that covenant still stand at this point? Absolutely not, because you've broken God's covenant over and over and over and over. And you see, just as Adam bore children of trespass, Jesus is going to bear children of righteousness. Righteous how? Because Jesus has kept the covenant. Jesus kept it, the only one that ever kept the covenant. And when he died, and when he rose again, he died with the imputed sins your imputed sins upon him. And when he rose again, he rose with life, life that is now imputed to you if you have been converted by God and not simply by some intellectual process. Where are we today? First of all, the old covenant there was a demonstration of man's inability to keep a covenant with a holy God. I have scriptures for you. I invite you to research them. Galatians 3, 15 to 18. Hebrews 8, 6 to 13. But that is what the old covenant was. It was a demonstration. It was a covenant. Absolutely. And God was going to keep his end of it. But people broke, their, broke that covenant in pieces. And it was weakened by the flesh and by their unbelief. But this new covenant is a demonstration of power to save and sanctify the church, foreknown and predestined by decree, soul by soul, event by event, until all the wheat is gathered into God's barn. And we give you... Uh, two verses here, Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, also 13, verses 24 to 30, the parable of the wheat and the tares. The scripture says that in the beginning, God sowed a field with wheat. In the beginning. It doesn't say throughout the day he sowed the field with wheat. From time to time, he dropped wheat into the field. That's not what the scripture says. The parable says, at the beginning he sowed wheat. And while he was asleep, somebody sowed tares. And he said, don't pull up the tares, you might pull up the wheat with it. Let the two grow up together. And in the end, when you know which is which, we can gather up the, the tares and burn them. 
and will gather up the wheat and bring that into my barn. Which are you today? You may say, well, if I am not destined to be saved, then there is no hope for me. Listen, you are here today. You are here today. That means God is drawing you to himself. You would be like everyone else out and not even caring that you're missing church. You're here today. God's hand is on you. This may be your appointed time. If you are the wheat that God planted, this may be your time to sprout today. If God is tugging on your shoulder, if he's tugging on your heart, and you need to be saved, and you know you need to give your heart to him, you tell him yes. You can tell him from where you're sitting, but if you don't know what's going on and you don't know what to do next, talk to me. I'm your pastor. Talk to a trusted Christian friend. Somebody who you know has been converted. And we will walk you through this. We're going to wait on you for communion this morning. We're not going to sing the last hymn. We're short on time. So we're going to ask the ushers to come forward and help us with communion this morning. invitation to communion is an open invitation in this church. That means you do not have to be a member of the church in order to take communion. But the parameters under which we ask you to consider whether you are going to take this are these. If you do truly and earnestly repent and intend to lead a new life, you may take this to your comfort. If you are already converted and walking in fellowship with God and with your fellow man, you may take this to your comfort. But if today you're in an unregenerate, unrepentant state, we advise you against it. Because as the scripture says, many have taken communion in an unworthy manner and have fallen ill because of it. as it's being passed around represents the body of Jesus Christ. It's been broken into pieces. The tradition of the covenant of bread is that the bread, having been broken, everyone who takes a piece of it and eats it is unified because of that love. Jesus is the bread. And this represents his body, which was broken for you. Meditate on these things while we finish passing out. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat.
this morning as we celebrated communion, we remember this, that sacrifice as his body was torn and you suffered and died. Your blood was shed that we might be saved. May each one of us accept that sacrifice. May we give our life to you and allow you and your spirit to control our thoughts, our actions, all that we do, so that we might know salvation that comes only through Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for the message today. Thank you for the opportunity to remember and reflect on your sacrifice for us. Bless us now as we go out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.